Welcome to the show, everybody. It is Monday, October 14th. This is episode 772 of Let There Be Talk. And before I even get into the show, I want to ask each and every one of you right now to press pause and go leave a review on iTunes or subscribe to my podcast on YouTube and leave a comment on there and share the show with your friends. This is very important. Helps with the uh, the algorithm of the Let There Be Talk uh, finding options. I don't even know what the fuck that means, but you know what I mean. Share it. You listen every week. Stop being fucking lazy. <laughs> fucking easy, man. Easy to do. If you're not going to join the Patreon, at least just throw it a little kind review on iTunes. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I got you working this morning for about 26 seconds. Anyway, welcome. Speaking of Patreoner, let's welcome the new Patreoners. Uh, it's been uh, it's been nice lately. A lot of new Patreoners, which is great. Lots of bonus episodes up there. Uh, here's the new Patreoners, Vivek Power, Vivek Power, and uh, hold on, let me get the other ones. Thought I, I thought I was equipped and ready. I am not, and uh, now I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. I'm over here. Oh, here it is. Will Putnam, thank you, and Troy Peffenberg, Cat Catamus. Machupa. Man, I'm telling you, the Dell Razors have some crazy names out there. Vivek Power, Cadmus Machupa, Troy Peffenberg. <laughs> Troy's a uh, Troy's a regular name, but you know what I'm talking about. That last name, Peffenberg. I've never met a Peffenberg. <laughs> anyway, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Thank you, everybody. And the tour dates, Dean Del Rey.com. Lots of tour dates coming up. Bakersfield, uh, San Diego, Modesto, Fresno, Ojai, Stockton, Visalia, Las Vegas, St. Louis, the Flyover Comedy Festival. Lots of stuff. DeanDelRay.com. Okay. I salute you. Uh, I think today's a, a, ho a holiday. What is it? It's like when I was growing up, it was, of course, Columbus Day, but uh, now it's Indigenous People Day. So a uh, shout out to the Indigenous people. Uh huh. You got your day right there. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, just just kind of uh, enjoying this kind of semi foggy weather. It's the morning. And I'm just getting up. I've had a uh, a good week. A good week. I will tell you, uh, anytime I'm doing comedy, it is a great week. Anytime I'm on stage. Last Tuesday, I think it was. Was it Tuesday? Let me look. Yes, it was Tuesday. I've been telling you guys. First of all, I think the funniest fucking thing is I'm telling I'm I'm telling everybody that I got like four concerts left of me which is true, unless it's certain groups, then I'll see them forever. And uh, and we'll get into who those groups are here. But a couple days ago, I was out hiking, and uh, I decided to take the Tuesday off to go see one of the great, great rock bands of the last 20 years, Rival Sons. I don't take days off anymore because it's so hard to get stage time that uh, to turn down any stage time would be absolutely fucking lunacy. Especially right now, I'm working on a lot of new stuff, and I need to be on as much as I can because I shot the special. It'll uh, eventually come out. And also, I'm, I kind of feel like I'm totally done with that material. I'd been doing it for over two years, and, uh, and some of it was wrote during COVID. So set it free. And just take on the uh, challenge of writing 
a new 45 minutes. I don't say hour because uh, I don't think anybody except for a few big comedians out there truly have an hour. And that's just my thoughts, especially in the world of, uh, of crowd work. You can't say you've got an hour of comedy if it's 30 minutes of where are you from? What have you been doing for a living? You single? <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I decided to take the Tuesday off. I was going to go to the Will Turn. I was going to see uh, Rival Sons Clutch and Blackstone Cherry. And I went hiking around 1030 in the morning. I go hiking every morning. I do about five miles. And uh, it's probably the only thing that's keeping uh, me sane right now. I don't know. You know, the older you get, the more cuckoo you get. You're just like, get out of here. Ah, urgh, fuck you. <laughs> get off your phone. Order your coffee. Ah. <laughs> so I'm up there hiking. I get a call. And my phone doesn't usually work up on the hills. You know, it's 2024. I guess uh, they can't push the signal up by uh, the Hollywood sign. <laughs> That's just impossible with the cell phones. But anyway, I get a call. I see it's Jay Buchanan, good friend of mine. Now, I already know I'm going to the show uh, later that night. And I figured... Well, he's probably calling to go get some lunch because he's in town and he's probably staying at a hotel around the wheel turn. I'll go pick him up. We'll eat some lunch and catch up. No better uh, day for me than shooting the shit with somebody like Jay Buchanan or, uh, you know, like Jacob Dillon was in town last week. That kind of stuff. See friends that I don't get to see a lot because we're both on the road. So I said, hey, man, what's happening? And he goes, well, uh, change of plans, buddy. And I thought, uh-oh. I thought, uh, I, I didn't know what was happening, what was going to come on that. Are they canceling or or uh, am I not on the list now? Who knows? And he goes, uh, Blackstone Cherry's tour bus broke down, and we really need you to open the show. Now, you know, I would say three years ago, I would be like, oh, hell yeah, cool. But I was hesitant for a minute because, you know, I've opened for bands. And and I tell everybody this, when you open for a band, somebody goes, hey, you opened for such and such. How was it? They never say it was killer. They either say, oh, it was awful, or they said, they say, uh, I made it through. I, I got through it. Now, I've had some incredible gigs opening for Marcus King a couple years ago when I did that uh, long run with him for two months. But some were not good. And I recently talked to a friend of mine who opened for a band, and he had to do, I think he had to do fucking 45, which is insane. And uh, I did do that bit where I say, uh, you know, I, I, I've i been out on the road opening for a rock band recently, which is weird because if the audience doesn't know there's a comedian on the show, they're always looking at me like, why is this roadie talking about his dick? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it is true. They come in, if you're not on the marquee, if you're not in the advertising and you come in, it reminds me of the early days when I started comedy, there would be these bar shows around town and these bar flies would hang out in their neighborhood bar. And then like once a week without notice or warning, their local watering hole would be fucking hijacked by some comic that thought it would be cool to do an open mic in the corner by the dartboard, right over by the dartboard, you know? And uh, or right in the middle of the Raider game. All right. We're going to have to turn the game off here because it's comedy night. Fucking nuts. Mm. So 
anyway, uh, I had opened for um, rock bands, like I said, I, and, and I had some amazing shows with Marcus King. And it was always when the audience was seated, say the Beacon Theater, the Ryman. I can count them on my hand, on my fucking one hand. The great ones, uh, Toronto, don't remember the name of the venue. Um, well, San Francisco, the ones where the people were seated, it was great. And I truly believe comedy and rock can work together if it's in a seated venue and it's advertised and promoted correctly. Like I was advertised big time on the entire Marcus King tour. I was part of the tour. Marcus and I had come up with the idea before COVID. So it wasn't just like, here you go. I opened for Metallica. They definitely were super amazing and let everybody know. They promoted me with photos for a month on their website and they uh, introduced me. So there's tricks to how to open for a rock band. And I really absolutely think now I understand how to do this animal. And uh, one of them is you must be in all the advertisement. All of it. Comedian. Two, the venue's got to be seated. That's fucking great. Like I just said. Three, and this one's vital. The main member of whoever the band you're opening for, say it was Metallica, Marcus King, Rival Sons, whatever, they have to introduce you because that lets their fans know we selected this guy. We're into doing a show outside the box. We know you could just have an opening band. We've seen that. Now look in the 70s. All kinds of people had comedians open, but it wasn't metal or it wasn't hard rock. It was usually like Sonny and Cher, John Denver, these kind of people. And they had uh, Elvis, you know, Polly Shore's dad uh, open for uh, Elvis for years. Um, Tom Driesen opened for Frank Sinatra for years. That's a different animal, though. Those are adults that like to sit down. They might like to laugh at a semi-racist joke. <laughs> um, so, okay. So you have the main member introduce you. Those are the three things that are going to make it a little better. So anyway, Jay calls. He says, Blackstone Cherries tour bus can't, uh, broke down. They canceled tonight. We need you to open. And like I said, I paused for a minute, and then I was like, you know what? I will do anything for Rival Sons. I don't even care how it goes. They called for a favor. I'm fucking there, you know? Uh, I love this band. I loved them from the second I heard them. And I loved him even more the second I started hanging out with him. Each guy in that band, Scott, Jay, Miley, Dave Besty, these guys are fucking solid, solid humans, man. I mean, some of my uh, best friends in this small, small world of Delray friends, I can count about 10 of them, and they are their for a reason because they're just great great humans i got a lot of surface friends when you're in the business of course you got a lot of hey how's it going cool how was your weekend that stuff but i'm talking about true true deep deep friendship at 58 years old uh there's a handful of guys that i talk to all the time you know, a Joey Diaz, a Bill Burr, obviously, Ian Edwards, you know, uh, some of my oldest friends, Joey, Fletch, Steve, but guys, old school friends, and uh, Jacob Dillon, the rival sons, 
these these people, you know, Kevin Christie. I wouldn't even probably be here. Well, I would be here, but I'd be all fucked up without Kevin Christie picking me off the fucking asphalt after the motorcycle crash. Anyway. Uh, so, like I said, I would do anything for these guys. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. Then he goes, okay. <laughs> this is the greatest. He goes, okay, we need you to do 30. I'm like, wait a minute. First of all, when you open for a band, you always agree to do 25, but you usually slip out of there after about 18 because it is just rough and everybody's fine with it. No one's going, hey, you got six, seven more minutes. Now with the Marcus tour, that really kind of turned into jokes and hosting and occasional singing uh, a song with Marcus at the end of the night. And I loved it, but it was it was really rough. In the two months I was out there, I um I was there were times where I was definitely calling Bill Burr and he was walking me off the uh the ledge because it wasn't necessarily the shows, it was the long, long, long days at the venue that I was no longer used to. The pulling into the venue at the uh you know, eight AM the load in while you sleep on the bus. Then you get up. I call it a, a shower at the venue tours. I was singing it to my buddy, like shout at the devil, but shower, shower, shower at the venue. <laughs> oh! um, but yeah, uh, you know, so you get in at 8 a.m. and then you don't leave till sometimes 2 or 3 a.m. So that was kind of grueling. Um, but still not complaining. I'd rather do that than not be working. So that's just the honest truth. And now that I look back on it, it was some amazing, amazing times. And I'm so fucking glad I did it. You know, I mean, I cherish those memories with, with that band and those laughs and the tour bus, Jason, the tour bus driver. And, uh, I even think about back to one of the shitty fucking roadies that thought he was funny by sabotaging my set sometimes by hitting the B3, boom, acting like he would, didn't know. I fucking knew. Fuck that guy with a giant fuck that guy loud. Anyway, uh, I love Marcus and uh, I can't thank him enough for taking me out. So they said 30 and I'm like, Mm. I say, look, how about if I do 20 and if it goes good, I'll do the 30. And, uh, and Jay's like, yeah, that's cool. Let's do it. So I get down there at like six whole different animal. Now I come down the mountain shower and start to try to figure out a good order for uh, a rock show. It's a different, different thing. I've got some bits that are about music and uh, going to concerts and people at concerts. I've got some of that. So I'm going to, I'm going to load the set up with a lot of that and, uh, and go down there and take a swing. Went down sound check. I didn't sound check. I don't need a sound check. I've done the wheel turn two times. I believe now I did it with Marcus. I did it. I can't remember who else with Maybe I've only done it. Nah, I think I've done it two times. Uh, Will Turn's one of the great, great venues of LA. I absolutely love it. 1930s, full-on art deco, beautiful theater. Beautiful theater. Google it and look at the photos if you haven't been there. The inside is just fucking, it's an honor. Ali Wong just shot her new special there, by the way. I'm giving her a little... Uh, a shout out, Ali Wong, one of my favorites. Mm. And uh, absolutely love Ali Wong because of her story. She's one of my inspirations. Nobody wanted to work with her. Nobody wanted her special baby Cobra. She shoots it herself, ends up selling it. It skyrockets her career after like 20 years. So those are the stories that I fucking love to hear. 
And uh, her special was shot at the wheel turn. Take a look at it. It looks beautiful. It looks like a, um, it looks like kind of a set of Academy Awards. Just beautiful. She looks amazing. She's happier than ever from what I can tell whenever I see her. Freshly divorced. <laughs> Just out what she calls getting dick down. It's so fucking funny to see Ali Wong, a mom, 42 years old, uh, Asian, you know, usually typically uh, a quiet soul at the store. And then you hear her material and you're just like, this is great. This is great. She's so fucking funny. Anyway, we'll turn. Go down, get ready. And uh, first thing I did, I asked Scott, to uh, Scott Holiday, if you don't know him, follow him, Mr. Fuzzlord, on Instagram, and follow the Rival Sons. Um, Scott uh, offers to um, bring me on stage, and I want to shout out Miley. Uh, Miley had texted me and said that it, it was his idea to open for me or open for them. <laughs> And I also want to shout out Mario from the old days of the Wallflowers because it was his idea to have me open for the Wallflowers like in 2006 or something. So these drummers are coming to my fucking, my savior. These drummers that I've featured on the podcast over the years are uh, giving the old Delray a little uh, boost. Anyway, so... I asked Scott to introduce me. At first, I asked just the side monitor guy because I was like, hey, who's going to introduce me? That's always the big fail when people ask a comic to do the show. They don't understand the dynamic. They just think you're going to drop the lights and a guy's going to walk out there and people are going to be like, oh, oh, cool. What's this? Some guy that may be doing material that offends me? I'm here for rock and roll. And I brought my kids, and you're talking about fucking dicks? <laughs> you're doing dick jokes. It's all ages. You always forget about that. So you got to adjust your set. You're looking out in the crowd like, oh, my God. Now, look, if there's old people there, old people, they let anything fly. Old people have been around uh, since fucking World War II. So they... They're like, oh, oh, this guy's funny. He's talking about uh, getting crabs. I had crabs in in the 60s when I went to Woodstock. <laughs> mm. Drinking a little tea there for the audio listeners. So uh, Scott walks out, introduces me, and he introduces me absolutely fantastic, which, by the way, Metallica the whole band introduced me, which was crazy, which was good and a bummer. I talked about it years ago when I did the show. The four guys at Metallica come up. Hey, you know, Lars, how's it going? Yes, we're excited to be here. You're all our friends and family. Very cool. You're here. Fuck yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Lars is Lars has like a uh, I I try I can I can kind of imitate him if I listen to him for a little bit, but he's kind of like a uh, uh, like a, a a Danish or he where's where's he from I can't forget fucking uh, not not yeah Sweden where is fucking Lars from I fucking know this guy and I'm drawing a blank because I'm uh, I'm old yes I'm old. My brain don't work anymore. Uh, let's see. Lars Ulrich. Lars Ulrich. Remember when you were young, you called him Ulrich? Lars Ulrich. <laughs> Danish. See, look at that fucking Del Rey. I fucking knew that. I just, you get older and you just know shit and you don't know shit. Lars is 60. All right. Fucking out there hammering it, killing it. Anyway, the band went out there, which I said was good. Metallica, when they uh, introduced me, and they're like, oh, I didn't finish my fucking thought here. Lars is like a Danish Kennedy, like, like JFK. Very cool to see you guys out here. <laughs> Ask what 
you can do for your country, not what your country can do for you. James is here. Robert Trujillo is here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> this is awful. Fucking Dean, you're awful at the Im Im impressions. <laughs> mm. Actually, it used to be pretty good at doing impressions, but then it was considered hacky, and I just threw the skill out. I was like, get rid of that skill. Uh, you know, it's funny. Bill Burr, he can do uh, Jim Florentine. Fucking perfect. I think I told, said it before. It's so funny. Hey, hey, Jim Florentine here on Sirius XM. We're going to listen to Clutch. Clutch is fucking great. They're coming out to the Scooby-Doo's in uh, Amsterdam next week. I'm going to catch Clutch. I can't do it. Uh, Scooby, Clutch is, Clutch is great. Sirius XM, Ozzy's Boneyard. Catch Clutch out at, uh, at, at McDougal, McDougal Schools. <laughs> Bill can do them perfect, man. It's so fucking funny. Sometimes he'll just, we were in the car going somewhere and we were listening to Ozzy's Boneyard and, and Jim was on and uh, Bill was doing them. <laughs> he was doing them perfect. It was killing me. So many hot chicks around. Oh my God. I wore a wig. <laughs> It's fucking, oh my God. I just made myself laugh because it was, so, it's just so funny when, when Bill throws out Florentine. Um, shout out to Florentine. I haven't seen him in almost a year now since the Bond Bash. Miss that guy. Anyway, so the band Metallica, which is great, they all four introduced you. So they come on this, the whole arena is like, yeah, 18,000 Metallica. And they're like, oh, we love you guys. Thanks for coming. Oh, uh, we'll, we're going to go back and put on our fucking rock and roll outfits. And uh, here's a comedian, our good friend from San Francisco, Dean Del Rey. Give him some fucking love. And good thing he doesn't say, like, for the next hour and a half while we're putting on some fucking spandex. Um, good thing they didn't say that. But they just said, uh, we're going to bring on our good friend, Dean Del Rey, and we'll be back in a little while. So it's like this, yay. And then it's like, oh, what? Like, like they just thought the band was coming on in their fucking street clothes and we're going to just start the gig with the lights on. I got a video, and it's still one of my... Favorite things that's ever happened to me in my life. Hands fucking down. Your favorite band of all time. Introducing you in your hometown. In the Chase Arena. Yeah, it's fucking... I've said it a million times. I could have got fucking, you know... I could have got pelted with fucking blow darts. <laughs> Remember those blow darts? <laughs> they always have them on the... Uh, like... Uh, What's that fucking Gilligan's Island? Some fucking voodoo guys shoot some blow darts at it. Anybody ever had that when you're a kid? You you just have the long empty bamboo thing and you fucking make a homemade blow dart thing. <laughs> blow darts, little fucking dart in your chest. I could have got pelted with blow darts. I'm feeling pretty good this morning, man. I don't know. I'm firing. I'm kind of firing on uh, some cuckooness. Anyway, um, it, it, it wouldn't have mattered how that went. Just to have those guys introduce me was one of the fucking giant nights of my career so far. So far. Anyway, so Scott walks out introduces me a great great introduction he's like look blackstone cherry's tour bus broke down they're not going to be here tonight we're very sorry but we have our very good friend uh, an amazing comedian who just shot his special in tennessee and he's been touring with bill burr all year he's gonna come out and make you laugh for a while and uh and then Clutch will be on, and then we'll be on in a little bit. And he brings me out, Dean Del Rey. Now, I think the biggest advice anybody can give you in doing comedy 
is be honest up there. That is something that resonates with the audience big time. So I just walk out there and I go, hey, man, uh, I was fucking hiking a couple hours ago and these guys asked me to open and I'm not going to lie. And I just basically told them what I told you guys. Opening for a band either goes really bad or it goes medium. It never goes good. And the audience immediately started laughing. And I realized something right away at that minute. I was like, oh, this audience is fucking good. You can tell instantly. They were quiet. They were listening. And I started in. Joke, 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 joke. And I started to fucking kill. And I was like, oh, shit. This is fucking going good. And then I really fucking started enjoying it. I was looking at people's faces. They were laughing. Also, this felt good. When they introduced me, a big round of applause. People knew who I was there, which meant that they listened to the podcast or they see me do comedy around town. And that gave me a little bit of an edge, which was really cool. So about mid set, I'm really fucking doing good. And then I almost fucked up. Some guy did a fucking, uh, the audience has been fantastic for now. I'm about 15 minutes in. And then one guy did the, and then I just fucking unloaded on him. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was like, oh, da, 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 da. fucking, can I take your order? I was just ripping on him, telling him how I was making more money that night than he made all month. Then he got angry, doubtful, doubtful. Which, by the way, when I got paid at the end of the night, I'm sure I did make more money than he's made all month. <laughs> I fucking, I want to give you a fucking heads up right now. About a year ago, I had read about Live Nation putting together this thing. I guess Willie Nelson came up with it. I remember, and I should have fucking looked it up, um, where if you're an opening band or an opening act on a, on a tour in America, on a major tour, and you're the opening act, Willie Nelson, fucking Willie, man, guy is so amazing. Uh, put together this program with Live Nation where the opening band gets a $1,500 cash bonus each night to help pay for hotels, gas, food, anything on their tour because these bands are working for peanuts. And so they at each night, you, it's kind of like a per diem each venue of 1500 cash, a fucking full on bump, which I can't even tell you, man, back when I was playing music, how much that would have helped me on the road each night, having actual $1,500 in cash in case you get a fucking flat tire in case the radiator blows. You, you know, one night everybody's just way too tired to drive. Let's get an extra, hotel room that's not in the budget so we can just go lay down. I mean, if I, I was telling a buddy of mine, he goes, fuck, we were out touring with Brian Setzer and we only got two fifty a night. If we got the 1500, it would have just helped us get through the tour and we wouldn't have been totally broke when we got home. Now, as much as this sounds like, you know, uh, like live nations being the hero. I don't really know what the, uh, what the background is on this thing, but I know Willie Nelson had something to do with it. And that's what matters most. And if they can give every band each night, there's hundreds of tours out there, 1500 cash. That's just a fucking scratch. Like a, like a, like that. I mean, that's a lot of money 
But man, imagine how much money is going in to be able to do 1500 all the openers in America each night. It's fucking wild. But man, did it help me, you know? Fuck, I got fucking taxes this week. And I was like, oh God, thank you. It's just brutal. Brutal out there, man. Taxes? Oh, fuck. It's gnarly. Anyway, so shout out to uh, Live Nation and Willie for that, man, which is great. So anyway, I yelled at the guy, and then I almost fucking alienated the crowd for a minute. I was like, oh, shit. And boom, got him right back with a joke. And then it was like, ooh, don't want to steer up. This isn't my audience, and uh, you, you don't want to fucking shit on one of the guys up there because then people are like, hey, man, that's one of our fucking... Our bros up there, which I get. I was just, sometimes you just like, you know, you get that fucking guy. <laughs> you know? Anyway, I fixed it. Kept going. Look at this. I'm doing like the Trump pants. Well, you be ba ba ba. Fucking. What's with the people that talk with their hands the whole time? Trump's always doing it. It's like those puppets. You know, the marionettes. It's fucking weird. We, you know, I was watching someone on stage and they were just, it was like hands, hands the whole time. Like I do some hands here and there, but some people just like when they're talking, it's just the fucking hands. It's crazy. Like, do they even know they're doing it? I, I can't tell you. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, so yeah, it went good, man. And I, it was one of my uh, proudest moments of my career because I had felt like, okay, I've wrangled this now. That's how I've said it in comedy a few years go by and you're like, okay, I kind of figured out how to do this. And then two, three years more in your career go by and you're like, oh shit, I figured out how to do this like opening or hosting or, or featuring or headlining or handling hecklers or, you know, missed flight, canceled flight, uh, you know, stretching longer on stage. Cause the other guy's not there. Just everything you start to learn, uh, not to put your hand up cause the fucking, the lights are blinding you. This is such a great goddamn rookie move. Well, are you out there? Yeah. He's fucking out there. Just act like you see him. You idiot. You don't need to see him. You know, like, uh, what's going on out there? Yeah. Who said that? Who said that out there? Who, is that you? Just fucking lay into the fucking comment. <laughs> anyway, so I felt really good. And also I felt so fucking good that I did good for the bands. You know, they put their neck out on the line. There's a bunch of Live Nation people there. They talk the next day. Oh, God, he came in here and just ate a fucking salty one, man. Oh, it was bad. As a matter of fact, I said uh, on the stage, the first thing I said was, you know, Jay called me and he said, hey, we need you. And I was like, can't you just get a DJ? Can't you just hire a guy for a hundred bucks? Brit from the boat. My buddy Britt from the boat. Can't you just get him come down and spin some Iron Maiden? You know? <laughs> anyway, I I felt great that I, I could help them. And it helped me, actually. You know, it, a lot of fucking people were happy. I was in the lobby. And they were like, you were great. Never heard of you. It just It was just a beautiful fucking night. Just a magic night. Thank you, Rival Sons. Clutch. Great to meet the Clutch guys. And, um, you know, go see. I think the tour ended last night. But go see Clutch. They're out doing some dates in December. Go see Rival Sons. They're out still doing a few more dates. And, uh, and dig into the Rival Sons and Clutch's catalog. A lot of records with these bands. A lot of good records. Eh, so yeah, my week has been full-blown rock and comedy. 
Like I said, I wasn't going to go to concert. I got like four concerts left in me. Greg Riley hit me up. He's like, I thought you weren't going to concerts anymore. I go, I thought so too. It was like the Godfather. They pull me back in. But like I said, certain acts I'll see to the day I die. Rival Sons, Radiohead, Tom Waits, uh, Nick Cave, Dead & Co., Bruce Springsteen, and this next one, Jack White. All right. I got the uh, text from the guys, Patrick, Jack White, those guys. Uh, Patrick, just a great, solid human who did this sweatshirt, by the way, for Maid Warren. Huey Lewis, I fucking love this sweatshirt. I've been wearing this thing for years and just, uh, I love how many people love Huey Lewis. When you wear this, Huey Lewis, fuck yeah, Huey Lewis. Um, God, so fucking bummed about his hearing. Can't sing anymore because of his hearing. Still been wanting to get him on the podcast. Huey Lewis, dream guest. Dream guest. Oh, my God. Bay Area legend. So I get the text. You want to come see Jack White? Now, I do not think. I do not think that anybody is talking enough about what the fuck Jack White is doing. This guy is a genius, an artist. I have labeled him, this is what I've labeled him, the new prince. He is that level to me. No matter what he puts out, it's great. He plays all the instruments. He writes hundreds of songs. He does whatever he wants to do, and he lays it out there when something is wrong, somebody's doing somebody wrong. Uh, he's not afraid to speak up about politics or the industry or anything. He's not worried about it sacrificing his career. He is a solid human first. And I truly believe, for me, he is the modern day right now prince. This guy, he's really doing something that nobody's doing other than Dave Chappelle. And that doesn't really count because you're not a band with Dave Chappelle. It does count. But I mean, it's, it's a little easier. Um, but Dave Chappelle and Jack White are huge, huge stars. They both can do the L.A. Forum. They both can do the Madison Square Gardens. They can do the Hollywood Bowls. But at the same time, this guy is going around America doing pop-up concerts, announcing them the day before, playing legendary punk rock venues like the Phoenix Theater in Petaluma. Shout out to Tom Gaffey. The Great American Music Hall in uh, San Francisco, not a punk rock venue, but a legendary venue. The Lodge in Highland Park. The Mayan downtown. Uh, you know, Seattle, just, he's just popping around, not telling anybody the tour, dropped the record out of nowhere, no name, and is having, it looked like to me and felt like as I talked to him, the time of his life. Like I said, I don't think people are talking about this enough. One of the things that I think is uh, genius about it, when he's this deep in his career, I've been watching this guy since the White Stripes. I saw the White Stripes at the Fillmore, Dead Leaves on the Dirty Ground era, and it fucking blew my mind. Blew my mind. And I've been watching him since that era, and the genius of this like I said, he could just do the form, keep doing the arenas year after year, slowly getting out of the hip community and just playing for the masses. But instead, he's like, nah, man, I got plenty of money. The guy's got a furniture company. The guy fucking makes furniture. He's got third man records. He's got a vinyl pressing place. He loves architecture. He's obsessed with guitar tones, guitars, amps, tubes, design, constantly changing his look, making sure the stage is cool. 
everything. The guy is fucking hands on deep into art. And it's uh it's inspiring, it's mesmerizing, and it's fucking beautiful. So Bill and I go, oh Billy, Billy Burr. And we go down to Highland Park, which is one of the great LA neighborhoods. Great. We go to a place on Figueroa called the Lounge, uh, the Lodge. The Lodge is a, a classic upstairs venue. One of those ones where you go upstairs, like on the street, it's the storefronts, like uh, a free note denim right there. Via's Tacos. Uh, across the street from the Highland Park 3 giant movie theater that just closed, God damn it. And uh, you go upstairs. It's kind of like something you would see in Detroit or Cleveland, the Agora Ballroom, that kind of thing. And you go upstairs, and there it is, a four to 500 uh, capacity small little theater, perfect for a comedy special. And uh, I wouldn't mind doing it with Bill, like just doing comedy in there. I think, I think I'm going to fucking see if we could do that. It'd be great. And um, you go in and there, you know, we're in there. Jack White is on stage blistering the crowd. Four, I think he's 49. And z I'm telling you, zero punching in on this guy. If you follow him on Instagram, you see him getting ready backstage, getting hyped up, ready to go. They go on stage, four-piece, keyboard player, unreal. He played with um, Sturgill Simpson for seven years. Patrick, the drummer, unbelievable. You know him, raconteurs um, and uh, Afghan wigs, great, great human. Bass player from Detroit, played on a lot of Jack White's uh, solo stuff. I don't have his name, unfortunately. They fucking murdered. Leather jackets. It's 105 degrees in the venue. Old school rock and roll. Nobody's complaining. Nobody's fucking, you know, bored. It is a punch in the fucking face. The highest level of art. And like I said, so inspiring to me and constantly keeps me going. People like him, Josh Homme, uh, Karen O, yeah, yeah, yes. Julian from The Strokes. These guys constantly keep me going. Radiohead, Tom York, you know, Tom Waits, all these people. So, you know, when I go see him, it's like a fucking it always seems to come right at the right time. Just this bolt of lightning into me. Like I got to get better. I got to keep going. I got to get my work ethic fucking up there. And uh, anytime you think I work hard, look at Jack White's fucking schedule. It is a mind boggler business owner, furniture builder, guitar amp designer, rock and roller, musician, songwriter, humanitarian, Fucking great. What a show, man. What a show. And I, I thank him for bringing that inspiration and what it does. The genius I thought of this was it put the heat back in the streets. That's what it did. It put the heat back in the fucking streets. The word of mouth from this tour Amongst the music freaks, the the hipsters, the people that fucking love shit, it throws the heat back in the street. Like, fuck, saw Jack White last night. The guy was fucking just as good as the first time I saw him 20 years ago. Unreal. Unreal, this guy. I'm telling you. I see Jack White and I'm like, man, I want to move to Nashville just so I could be fucking around this guy and uh, get engulfed in the inspiration. <laughs> fucking great. So yeah, I go see Jack White. So there I am, two concerts in, Rival Sons, Jack White. And then um, I saw 
you know, Jacob Dylan last week, Wallflowers. I'm going to see Tropical Fuckstorm on, on Tuesday, which is one of the greatest bands I've seen in 20 years. Tropical Fuckstorm out on tour right now from Australia. They rarely tour the States, so you have to see them when they come. And then last night I went to go see Billy Joel. Okay, Billy Joel uh, is somebody I have never seen. And I was like, I've got to click Billy Joel off the, off the list. And uh, my good friend worked for Billy Joel, same guy that worked for Bruce Springsteen. Uh, I had not seen Elton John. I got to see him a couple years ago. I've seen Bruce a bunch, and now it's time to see Billy Joel. Now I'll click off those kind of, uh, you know, singer, songwriter, big 70s fucking just massive talents. Billy Joel is somebody I listened to a lot in the 70s with my mom. Another uh, musician that my mom and I really related to over. Carol King, you know, Billy Joel. That kind of stuff. Uh, Mom was a Bruce fan before me. (laughs) Uh, I miss you, Mom. When I first started taking singing lessons, I was telling somebody this. There's nothing more nerve-wracking than singing lessons because you go to a first teacher. You know, when you're in L.A., you go to a singing coach or Nashville or New York. It's somebody that works with big celebrities like an Axl Rose or, or, you know, they're always like uh, Seth Riggs, uh, instructor for Axl Rose, Stephen Piercy, uh, you know, Cindy Lauper, Madonna. They always have these big, long list of uh, celebrities. But when you're taking singing lessons in the Bay Area, you just kind of go to the music store and you see a billboard uh, like a fucking one of those things you pull the tab vocal lessons and you go so my mom knew I wanted to be a singer and I was trying to figure out how to sing without losing my voice so she finds some old lady in Novato hold on let me get a hit of this tea here Mm. Novato California and she would drop me off. God bless my mom. She was just a fucking soldier. Anything I wanted to do, she'd go, you're going to do it. And you have to do it at the fullest, um, you know, head on, full steam. No punching in like BMX. I'll buy the van and uh, I'll get a second job and we'll we'll drive you around in the van to raise BMX. You want to play music? I'll find the vocal coach. I'll pay for it. You're going two times a week, no matter if you like it or not. (laughs) Anyway, some old lady at this music store in uh, Novato, just kind of those music stores that kind of had rooms in the back. There'd be like a guitar teacher, and then the other one would be like a vocal coach. There was a piano in there. And I went in and met the lady and it is so fucking nerve wracking singing with no effects or microphone or anything. And she's there with the piano and you just start with these warm ups. Okay, let's try ah, 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 more tongue, but push your tongue against your teeth. Oh, <laughs> and you're doing that. And all you're thinking about is whatever girl you have the crush on, you hope she doesn't open the door and just see you there. Oh, without your you know your rock and roll leather pants and your your fucking bandana you're just there like oh and she's like oh what a goon <laughs> my point is when i would go in we would warm up and then we always played 
uh, sang two songs. First one was Hello by Lionel Richie. Hello. And the other one was Billy Joel. Don't go changing to try to please me. I love you just the way you are. Morning voice. This is my morning voice. I love you just the way you are. Don't go changing to try to please me. Yeah, Hetfield. I love you just the way you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm making myself laugh. Yeah, yeah. There's that guy that's doing the Yacht Rock Metallica shit. I, you know, like, when it's Instagram, you'll get, like, one clip of somebody, uh, Metallica Sandman Yacht Rock, and you're like, this is cool. And it's like this guy's wearing, like, a fucking captain's hat, you know, from fucking Captain and Tennille. Remember them? Captain and Tennille. Um, and then you watch it, and you go, this is cool, man. It's like Yacht Rock, uh, which I hate that word, Yacht Rock. <clears throat> is Billy Joel considered Yacht Rock now? It's just like, what a fucking... Put down Yacht Rock. And I said it before. I hate that guy. Yacht Rock Radio. Sirius XM guy. Just call it fucking great songs. Yeah, like like masterpiece songs. Billy Joel. Fucking selling out 100 shows at Madison Square Garden at 75 years old. One a month. Selling out the fucking uh, SoFi last year with Stevie Nicks. Uh, a, a stadium. He's doing stadiums. Gertie's over there getting crazy. Anyway, my point is, uh, you know, you see one of these videos and it's like, cool. And then all of a sudden, everybody starts sending you the guy's Yacht Rock catalog. Yeah, uh, Sawyer done Yacht Rock. It's like, look. It was fun the first time. I get it. But fucking, that's your career now? Just like, all right, I'm going to just do Instagram videos of me doing Yacht Rock. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Whatever you got to do. But I'm just saying, it's like after a while, you're like, oh, I, I got it the first time. It was fun and cool the first time. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, ooh, here's his 700th Yacht Rock song. Yeah, you know, Anthrax, Yacht Rock. It's a madhouse, so they say. <laughs> oh, my God. So I had not seen Billy Joel. He's playing this new air, uh, thing, Into It Dome, the Clippers uh, Arena, which I had watched a lot of videos and read a lot of hype on this uh this arena, uh, the owner paid for it with his own money, which is fucking genius. No, you never see an owner going out of his own pocket to do a goddamn fucking anything. They're so greedy. They just write, yeah, yeah, let's get the city to pay for it. And the tax tax fucking payers. Let's get them to pay for my billions dollars teams arena. Anyway, so he built it. He paid for it. But I will say this. I didn't care for it. Um, I'll take the form, which is one block away. The form is fucking legendary. It is magic. They got the form room. They got great, great parking. They have amazing sound now. It's only for music. And it is legendary. The Intuit Dome, they don't take any cash. And these fuckers, the first thing they want to do. Now, look, I'm not one of those conspiracy guys and any of that lunacy. But this is just bullshit. You show up, you got to sign up on this app. You got to put all your credit card info in it. And uh, so, you know, right now they have everything about you before you can even fucking go in the arena because they don't take cash or cards or anything. You have to go in there and it's all facial recognition. It's just bullshit, you know? 
And if you were a guy living off the grid, you'd be like, fuck you. You ain't getting my eyeball scan. But it's, you know, look, they already have everything on us. My point is, this is just extra bullshit because you get there and they go, well, you got to, you know, you didn't download the app and then you got to. Look, if you're going to the Clippers every couple nights, I understand it, but I don't want to fucking download the app for one concert a year I might be going to and give you all my info and then, you know, stand in line because the Wi-Fi is not that good waiting for the app to download and then put in all my fucking info just to go into a concert for two hours. That is fucking stupid. Big time. And I know it's like a green venue, which is cool. I'm down with saving the earth and all that, but fuck you. I got like 18 forms of payment in my phone right now I can swipe with. I've got cash in my left pocket that's no longer good, you know? You know, they're trying to take away our cash. They're trying to get rid of that currency so then they can just control us. And they can just turn off our banks and then they've got us. Yeah, fuck. They already got us. That's not what it's about. To me, it's just about getting ready to go into the show. And then there's like 800 people that have like, you know, four Miller High Lives. And now they don't know how to operate their fucking apps because they're Billy Joel fans and they're 60 plus. And they're going, what, what do you mean? Download an application. I don't need a job. I don't want to fill out an application. No, sir. It's an app. It's a, it's a photo. It's a phone app. I, I, I don't need a job at the Intuit Dome. I want to see Billy Joel play Big Shot. God damn it. We can't start the fire. <laughs> Fucking. It is true, though, man. These people don't know how to work their phones. I know how to work my phone like crazy because I'm in the biz. I'm constantly making videos and fucking and podcasting and editing and, and, you know, uh, TikTok bullshit and fucking all that stuff. These guys are barely above Facebook and they're only on Facebook so they can go on and go, my fucking, my person I'm voting for is better than your person. That's all they're on there for. So you're just standing in line and you're just going like, this is fucked. And then you get in. So I get in finally. And I uh, went for a good buddy of mine, Richard, who, by the way, we're doing the uh, the Janie's Got a Fun benefit in January at the Comedy Store. Steven Tyler has asked me and Richard, they have asked me to, to help and put on a comedy show. It is an honor to do this for Steven Tyler. So uh, Richard and I went. He is uh, one of the main guys of Janie's Got a Fun, an incredible uh, organization helping uh, women out there. And uh, we went. Now, like I said, I grew up on Billy Joel. But once I got to the Billy Joel f- uh, show, I realized, oh, I may be just a surface fan, just a Hits only Billy Joel. I realized that I'd only had two Billy Joel records in my whole life. And now I, I understand whenever I go, Def Leppard should play the high and dry record. And then, then you realize they can't do that. They got to play the hits. Well, I went to Billy Joel and for the first hour, he played a lot of fucking deep tracks. And I was sitting there going like, oh, man. I'm I'm I I should have went on stage tonight uh, at the comedy store man I'm fucking I'm lost here this is not grabbing me I need the hits I need the fucking let me get the set list here I need you know because I I realized I'm not a like I said I'm not the fucking full Billy Joel that I thought I was I thought now Billy Joel look I saw fucking Elton John I mean 20 songs just slaying Bruce 25 songs just slain and I'm sure to a lot of the Billy Joel fans in there sold out fucking Intuit Dome 
that they were losing their minds, but I was uh, having a tough time. They opened with a song called Miami 2017. Uh, See the lights go out on Broadway. Didn't know it. Then they did Pressure. Of course, I know that. Then they did a snippet of Good Times, Bad Times by Zeppelin. And I was like, oh, fuck, yeah, now we're going. Then they did a song, Vienna. Didn't know it. Then did a song called The Mexican Connection. Uh, tour debut, first time since 1984. So I'm sure the fans were going crazy. Which, by the way, I want to give big, big, big shout out to Billy Joel, man. What a fucking performer and front man and voice. And um, his in, in between interlude, his, his dialogue and shit was so goddamn funny. He said one thing, he goes, okay, some good news and some bad news tonight. The bad news is we don't have a new record out. And uh, the good news is you don't have to sit through a bunch of shitty new songs. <laughs> I was like, this guy's fucking great. Now, I don't want anybody to get this wrong. Billy Joel is a legend, and he fucking sounds great, and he is amazing, okay? Unless you're one of his ex-band members, then you might not think he's amazing. But he was killing. But for me, I was like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. And what it was starting to do to me was it was starting to aggravate me because these uh, these whatever the Billy Joel fans may be called, the uh, old people, the uh, Billy White hairs, which, by the way, at 75, does anybody call him Bill? Bill Joel? I mean, Billy's kind of like, you know, Bill Burr used to be Billy Burr before I knew him, you know, and now people call him Bill Burr. What, is it a time to call Billy Joel Bill? Bill Joel? <laughs> Fucking, right? Bill Joel. You're 75. Anyway, fucking love Billy Joel, genius songwriter. Uh, but, you know, it started to remind me of the things, one of the things I hate more than anything in America are those piano, dueling piano bars, you know those, where there's two people on a piano, there's a bunch of white women drunk singing, you know, from the, we can't stop the fire! And they're dancing in their fucking bedazzled pants and their bad, bad fucking plastic surgery, spilling beers, drinking way too... This couple next to me, I said it at Bruce, and now I'm going to say it here. This couple next to me, they drank 18 drinks. It was unreal right next to me. And I was constantly doing like, hey, fucking don't be spilling on me. And they were totally cool until about eight songs in. And then they just jumped up and were, we're drunk now. Here we are. We're different people now. In the hour, we transformed into shitty people. <laughs> I mean, it was one of those piano bars. That's what it turned into. Man, there used to be one at um, Universal Studios. And it was right next to the John Lovitz Comedy Club. And I'd walk by it on Friday nights. And I just looked in there like I would peek in and go, not, not for a fucking second would I be in there. Not for a fucking second. Oh, man, in there. Oh, anyway, this is obviously Jimmy Buffett type of uh, crowd, you know. Billy Joel, uh, Jimmy Buffett. He played the entertainer, you know, a, and, and Billy was cool. He was like, this was a mild hit. You know, it wasn't like a fucking, didn't buy me a new car. It was a mild hit. And the way he's introducing the songs, I fucking loved him. At the same time, I hated the show. It was amazing. Like I was like, I love this guy. I want to see him on Broadway by himself telling stories without the fucking the Billy Whiteheads and, uh, you know, maybe have no beer allowed Broadway and let this guy fucking shine, man. I mean, he's shining already, but you know what I mean? He's a goddamn songwriting legend. And there's this part in there of these people 
that are just fucking nuts. <laughs> then he played The Lion Sleeps Tonight, which uh, which was a cover. I have no idea what that is. So the first hour, Root Beer Rag, instrumentally he's all, yeah, this one's off this one record. And the people cheered. He goes, fuck you. He didn't buy that record. It was a bomb. Don't act like you bought it. I'm amazing. The way he fucking talked, it was great. Uh, then, you know, 15 songs in, he starts to come on to the hits. 15 songs in. This is the time. John Mayer walks out. I'm like, what the fuck? One of my favorites. That couldn't even light me up. That couldn't even get me out of my seat. One of my favorites of all time, John Mayer. And I was like, uh huh, fuck. Uh, anyway, 15 songs in, they go Allentown, 16, Say Goodbye to Hollywood, then New York State of Mind, then Live and Let Die with Axel. They bring Axel out. That didn't even get me out of my chair. <laughs> Fucking Axel. Uh, then moving out, great fucking song. My life, fantastic song. Only the good die young, great. Uh, sometimes a fantasy. I don't remember that one. A river of dreams. Don't know it. Nusen Dorma, uh, which was like this Italian, uh, like opera song that the guitar player sang. Scenes from Italian restaurant. Then piano man, which is fucking when. The entire white hairs jump up and lose their mind. Piano man. And it's like this fucking pocket of, uh, uh, what is that fucking, uh, that place in New York they all live in? Uh, oh, fuck. I can't even draw the name now, right now. Um, Staten Island or whatever out there, you know? Then they get the, the encore is really the punch in the face. We didn't start a fire uptown girl. It's still rock and roll to me. Big shot. You may be right. Killer. Look at those songs. Just those alone. Killer. He didn't play just the way you are. I was like, oh my God, I'm here for some sentimental reasons, dude. Play the song. Anyway, it turns out. I'm a surface Billy Joel fan. And I admit it. I saw Billy. I'm good. Don't need to see it anymore. I will tell you this right now. It goes like this for me. Bruce Springsteen, Elton John, Billy Joel. All right. Um, Bruce, the king in this type of music, this East Coast singer, songwriter, -y, piano, rock and roll from the 70s with a lot of uh, Motown flavor in there and 50s Elvis rock and roll. That's where those guys grew up on. And uh, so, yeah, I saw Billy Joel and uh, I loved him. Didn't like the show. And that was just me because I didn't know the fucking material. And sometimes you go to a show and you don't know the material and you go, fuck, I don't give a fuck. Jack White, we're talking to fucking Patrick after the show and we go, yeah, you guys got a set list? And they go, no set list. We hadn't even played any of those songs tonight, ever. Just got to know everything in Jack's cat in, in his, in his um, you know, in his discovery. And, uh, and then he just yells out the tunes. I'm like, fucking, now that is fire. Just dangerous. Anyway, thank you, Billy Joel, for the incredible hit songs that you do have, man. I love it. Zane Oleglin. I want to shout you out. Another Patreoner, Zane Oleglin. I want to thank Ravel Sons. I want to thank Jack White. I want to thank Willie Nelson. I want to thank every arena on the planet for playing Seven Nation Army to keep a rock and roll song live and well uh, in the world. Seven Nation Army. Back in Black and We Are the Champions uh, or Hell's Bells. Those are some of the biggest stadium rock songs of all time. I want to thank all of you for joining me today, listening to my lunacy. Keep the candles lit. I'll see you out on the road. DeanDelRay.com, tour tickets, all of that. 
Have a great week. And if you join the Patreon, I will be doing a Zoom fest this week, a live Zoom with you Patreoners. I love you. See ya.